Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. And thank you for joining the Cooling Deep Dive Workshop, Innovative and Sustainable Cooling Solution for Asia and the Pacific, which is co-organized by Asia Development Bank, Asia Development Bank Institute, UK Government, and Sustainable Energy for All. I'm Claudine Leros Riskio, and I will be introducing the speakers and panelists in today's workshop. So please let me start with introducing you, Dr. Nam, which is Principal Energy Economist of the Asia Development Bank, who will give you a welcome address. So Dr. Nam is part of the Sustainable Development and Climate Change Department. He's also responsible of the Energy Sector Trust Funds. And prior to joining the ADB, he worked at the International Atomic Energy Agency, the Institute for Applied System Analysis, and the United Nations Development uh, Industrial Thank you. Please, Dr. Nam. Thank you. Thank you, Claude Hilde. Thank you for the you know, short introduction. Yeah, uh, Dr. Kasushi Sonobe, Dean and CEO of the Asian Development Bank Institute. Dr. Peter Warren, Head of Climate Finance for Innovation in the UK BIS. And Dr. Claude Hilde, Rossi, DCU from the System of Energy for All, SE for All, distinguished panelists, participants, and colleagues. Good afternoon, good morning, and good evening. On behalf of ADB, it is my pleasure to welcome you all to this deep dive workshop on innovative cooling solutions. Holding this workshop is both timely and appropriate. It was estimated that more than 1 billion people globally lack access to cooling solutions impacting health, agriculture, food, security, productivity, and economic growth. It is expected that the demand for cooling will continue to grow due to the, you know, the economic growth as well as the population growth, increasing urbanization in the DMCs as well as the rising incomes in the developing member countries. The occurrence of the COVID-19 emphasizes the need for efficient cold chains for the health sector, for transportation and storage of vaccines. The pandemic is far from over and the rolling out of COVID-19 vaccines will require enormous capacity for global cold chains to ensure the quality and safety of the products and maintained from the production site and throughout the distribution channels. ADB to, has initiated a number of cooling projects and our colleague, who is also one of our panelists, Daniela, will talk about the initiative in Thailand to deliver efficient and affordable air conditioning units using a digital platform. Under the technical assistance projects that the energy sector group is directly managing, we are currently developing a pilot project, a pilot project on solar for the voltaic grid tied cold storage system through a net metering arrangement. The project will provide a cold storage solutions for uh, fresh vegetables, including onions and other high value crops in, in, the, in the Philippines. We are privileged to be joined by our distinguished panelists who will share their experience on sustainable cooling. They will discuss the status and trends of various cooling technology solutions, as well as the approaches and business models. We hope that today's discussion will yield fav favorable results towards the deployment of sustainable cooling at scale. Our intention is to ensure that the event organized will result in substantial outputs moving forward. Allow me to thank you for taking time to attend this deep dive workshop. Specifically, I would like to comment the CFOL, ADBI, and the UK government for making this event possible and for putting together this panel of experts. I look forward to a vibrant interaction among our panelists and the participants. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Nam, for your welcome address. Let me introduce you now to Dean Sonobe, who will be giving the opening remarks for the Asia Development Bank Institute. 
Dean Sanobe is Dean and CEO of the Asia Development Bank Institute. Dean is PhD in economics from Yale University and is BA in economics from the University of Tokyo before joining the ADBI in April. He served as a vice president of the National Graduate Institute for Policy Studies in Tokyo and taught economics for 30 years at Tokyo Metropolitan University in Greece. Thank you. Thank you, Dean Sanobe. Thank you, Clotilde, for kind introduction. A good day. Uh, this is the first day of the Asia Clean Energy Forum 2021. Uh, welcome to the forum and the deep dive workshop on innovative and sustainable cooling solutions. Uh, the theme of the ACEF 2021 is accelerating the low carbon transition in Asia and Pacific reflecting the increasing number of governments and the businesses announcing that they are going green. Uh, this gives us optimism that the growing preference for energy efficiency and renewable energy will help fast track the region's clean energy transition. The forum will also serve as an important platform for dialogue leading up to this year's United Nations Climate Change Con uh, Conference or the COP26 Summit to jointly tackle climate change. ADBI is pleased to co-organize this deep dive workshop in collaboration with our excellent partners, including Sustainable Energy for All, the Government of the United Kingdom, and ADB. It's my great pleasure and honor to provide welcome remarks here on behalf of all co-organizers. I'm also pleased to have the opportunity to listen to the distinguished speakers and moderators from the International Finance Corporation, Rocky Mountain Institute, Alliance for an Energy Efficient Economy, Promethean Power, Lawrence Barclay uh, National Laboratory, US Department of Energy, as well as the co-hosting organizations. The cooling sector, that is air conditioning and the refrigeration for storing and the transporting perishable goods, uh, is projected to be one of the top drivers of electricity demand over the next few decades, particularly in Asia and the Pacific. The cooling sector is consuming enormous amounts of fossil fuel powered electricity, <laughs> making a significant contribution to greenhouse gas emissions and air pollution. According to the International Energy Agency, air conditioners and electric cooling fans account for nearly 20% of the electricity used in the world's buildings. Cooling will continue to play a critical role in influencing the trajectory of climate change. Since demand for cooling in the Asia Pacific regions, developing and emerging economies is growing rapidly, the promotion of sustainable cooling solutions will hold the key to achieving the Paris Agreement the targets and the sustainable development goals. Countries need to seize every opportunity to make cooling a part of the climate solution. However, uh, there are gaps in knowledge and the capacity that stand in the way of achieving this goal and which uh, this deep dive workshop will help to address. ADBI will build on this work after the workshop through a call for papers on low carbon cooling, which will last until the end of next month. Uh, you can learn more about the call for papers on the ADBI website, uh, adbi.org. I'd encourage our audience to actively participate in the workshop by typing their questions. We will do our best to answer as many questions as we can uh, during the session. Your questions will also guide our future work on today's important topics. Uh, we greatly appreciate your participation. I stop here. And thank you for your Attention. Uh, Clotilde, over to you. Thank you very much, Dean Sonobe, for uh, the opening remarks. Um, thank you also for reminding the audience to type Q&A. We had there is a Q&A box, so make sure to 
type your questions there and uh, we will try to get back to you during the panels and the Q&A sessions afterwards. And um, let me now introduce you to Dr. Peter Warren uh, from the UK government. So Dr. Peter Warren is head of uh, climate finance for innovation in the UK government's department for business, energy and industrial strategy. He manages the UK international climate finance investments and international policy for clean energy innovation. Peter previously worked in the International Energy Agency on energy efficiency in emerging economies and worked as sustainable sustainability manager in industry. So thank you, um, Peter, for giving us um, the, um, an opening presentation. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, good morning, uh, good evening, or if it's the middle of the night and, uh, and like me, you see this as a very incredible and important um, topic that we really need to do something about and it keeps you up at night, uh, then uh, welcome from the middle of the night. Um, so just to introduce myself, I'm uh, Peter Warren. I'm head of innovation at IFA International Climate Finance in the UK government's uh, department uh, for business, energy and industrial strategy. Uh, you'll also hear from a number of my uh, colleagues throughout the week uh, in the plenary sessions, uh, in, this, in, uh, in the wider sessions as well, um, on various different themes and what we'll be doing uh, for COP26 um, and what we want to do uh, is raise ambition in the region uh, in Asia Pacific. Uh, but today I'll be here specifically talking about um, sustainable cooling. Um, and we've been fortunate enough to be uh, co-organizers uh, of this workshop uh, for about four years now um, with Sustainable Energy for All, uh, the Asian Development Bank and the uh, ADB Institute. Um, so it's great and it's fantastic to be here uh, again to be uh, uh, co-organizing uh, this workshop. Now, what we've seen over the last uh, three or four years at the Asia Clean Energy Forum um, is a real growth in discussion on this important topic. And we really wanted to, uh, this year, uh, focus in on innovation. So what are, the, what are the potential solutions that are out there that perhaps are not yet at the commercial readiness uh, that they need to be? Uh, and what can we do uh, to accelerate some of these exciting and really important uh, innovations in technology, uh, in business models, um, and in market building. And that will be the focus uh, of the two panel uh, discussions. And it's absolutely fantastic that we've got such a great range of uh, speakers from different organizations with lots of different experience in the region um, to really push forward the debate, push forward the discussion on knowledge and the capacity gaps that um, the previous uh, speakers uh, from the ADB Institute uh, just spoke about. So this is going to be uh, something we're really excited uh, to push forward the discussions on. Um, so just really quickly, I just wanted to set a bit of context for the Kulin uh, debate. You, you've heard this uh, as well in the previous presentations, and you'll hear uh, this more uh, in the panel discussions. Um, but just to give a few quick, quite hard-hitting stats, but also the, I want to focus on uh, the, the opportunities as well. Um, we see for, from some of the, the really recent analysis that our co-organizers, Sustainable Energy for All, uh, have recently done. So in 2021, they brought out some a new analysis that's showing that 3.43 billion people face uh, access to cooling challenges, and an additional 50 million are at high risk uh, this year. But if we look at the role of innovation, innovation could have the potential to mitigate half a degree of warming in temperatures. But conversely, and this isn't on the slides, but conversely, uh, by using conventional approaches, uh, approaches to uh, cooling access issues, it may lead to an increase um, of 0.5 uh, degrees. Um, some, also, some recent work has come out from McKinsey uh, last year that, that really looks at the region, uh, particularly focusing on South Asia. What we can see is about 500 to 700 mi million people, unfortunately, um, have an annual probability of a 20% increase of uh, being vulnerable to lethal heat waves. Um, in India, if we look at GDP, uh, about 2.5 to 4.5% GDP loss per year uh, may result from an increase in lost daylight working hours. Um, but as I said, it's not all bad news. Um, innovation does have the, uh, the potential to reduce some of those emissions. Um, but linking to what um, our previous speakers just said uh, about generation capacity, um, it can reduce uh, generation capacity needs by about 100 uh, gigawatts by uh, 2040. And that's some of the recent analysis from the International Energy Agency. Um, which is why in this workshop, um, we want to focus on two main parts of the innovation story. 
Um, firstly, uh, innovation in technology, and we'll hear from some speakers that have um, been looking at this in, in the region, but also innovation in business models uh, and market uh, building. And this is a really important part of um, ASEF's theme this year of accelerating low carbon transitions uh, in the region. Um, just to give a flavour of some of the things that might be discussed as well, um, but, but, but definitely not an exhaustive list of, of solutions. But um, what we've seen is lots of developments in uh, the role of innovations in on-bill finance and subsidies and incentives for sustainable cooling to really address uh, one of the core barriers, which is the initial upfront costs of some of the um, tech that's not quite at the, at the full commercial stage yet. Um, what the a really important consideration is that um, local conditions are paramount in this discussion. What innovation works in one local context may not work at all in another local context because of different enabling environments, different market structures, different policy incentives. Um, so really important that there's a lot of flexibility in the innovations that are produced, but also um, where they'll be most appropriate um, to be tested. Um, you probably have heard of Cooling as a Service. This has had quite a lot of attention uh, on this topic as an innovative business model. Um, the Kigali Cooling Efficiency Programme has estimated that it may help to lead to about 20% of electricity savings. Um, and there are other innovations that we'll hear about uh, today uh, on the financing and business model side. Um, previously, I, I talked about the importance of uh, saved generation and transmission costs. Um, if you put that in context of, of uh, dollar figures, it's about $3 trillion that could be saved um, in, uh, in generation transmission costs um, from, from purely looking at energy efficiency improvements in cooling. Um, now, as I've highlighted, it's a, it, it's a multifaceted um, element. Um, energy efficiency will be absolutely crucial in the cooling debate, but the debate in cooling is not just about efficiency, it's also about how can you think of new ways of delivering uh, cooling services as well from a, a conventional approaches. Um, I mentioned COP26 at the start. Uh, the most relevant campaign that we're working on in this space uh, is on product efficiency, um, specifically looking at industrial motors, air conditioners, uh, refrigerators and lighting. And uh, through the super efficient equipment and appliance deployment initiative, which really rolls off the tongue as an initiative, and I much prefer just to say SEED because it's a lot easier to say, um, but one of the key things that that will focus on is establishing roadmaps uh, towards 2030 for cooling and how do we move up product efficiency standards over time. You may have followed um, in the last couple of weeks uh, that Mission Innovation launched its second phase, which is really exciting. Um, one part of that is there was a very successful challenge in the first phase on affordable heating and cooling of buildings. Um, and uh, the next phase will look to expand that through the innovation uh, platform. Um, I thought it'd be helpful, hopefully, <laughs> just to touch a bit on what the UK is doing, both domestically, but also internationally, and particularly in the region. Um, just at a high level, you may have seen that we announced a 78% emissions cut by 2035 in our sixth uh, carbon budget, uh, and that we legislated that, and that builds on our previous legislation of net zero by 2050. Um, you will have seen uh, over the weekend the um, G7 Leader Summit, uh, some of the discussions there. Um, we're obviously presidents, our pre presidencies of the G7 and, and will be the incoming COP26 uh, president. Um, on international climate finance, uh, we also announced a doubling of our international climate finance to 11.6 billion over the next five years. So this is official development assistance and, and aid spend. Um, and I'll talk a little bit in the next slide about how that relates to Kulin, uh, just to finish off my presentation. Um, but if you're interested domestically, we're also quite um, uh, sort of strong and looking at F-gas regulations and really um, raising the bar there. And we'll bring forward um, new proposals uh, next year with how we can do further reductions uh, in hydrofluorocarbons uh, in line with net zero ambitions. Uh, also in buildings, we're uh, bringing out a new future home standard from 2025 to look at large cuts in emissions in buildings. Um, and our green industrial revolution 10 point plan includes um, a desire to bring out an energy related products policy framework, which should be published uh, later this year. Um, I mentioned in the previous slide about international climate finance. Um, now as part of our mission innovation uh, commitments, which was to double our spend on energy innovation by 2021, which we exceeded, as part of that, there was an international climate finance commitment. And last year, we um, uh, announced a new program 
called the Clean Energy Innovation Facility to support developing countries to accelerate uh, the commercialization of clean tech. Um, a big part of that facility is focused on cooling innovation. Um, and it's great that we've got um, some of our speakers like the International Finance Corporation, you'll hear from very soon, who are delivering uh, this, uh, this, this sustainable cooling fund uh, for us. We just launched um, the phase, the Asia part of the, this program, um, particularly uh, in India, and will expand uh, over the coming year. Um, this builds off some of our successful work uh, outside of the region, in other regions, in Mexico, Colombia, uh, and Nigeria. Um, now, just to finish, this is my last slide as I'm coming to the end of my slot. Um, just to show what's coming forward, um, my colleague, Le uh, Leila Kanji from the UK government, um, from the same department in Bayes, uh, she'll be uh, moderating the first panel where we look at innovative clean tech, and we'll have um, uh, leading speakers from the International Finance Corporation, Promethean uh, Power Systems and Rocky Mountain Institute. Before we go on to the second panel, uh, where we'll look more at the financing um, elements, business models, market building innovation, uh, where our co-organizers, uh, Clotilde rossi Desquio from the Sustainable Energy for All, um, will moderate that panel where we'll hear from Energy Efficiency Services Limited, uh, the Asian Development Bank, and the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, which is part of the US Department of Energy, before we have some closing remarks uh, from Sustainable Energy for All. Um, so I just want to say thank you uh, again for joining the workshop. It's going to be a really exciting workshop. Uh, really looking forward to, to the discussions. Um, and without further ado, I will hand over to my colleague, uh, Leila Kanji. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much to Dr. Peter Warren for uh, presenting an overview of the workshop uh, and the importance of sustainable cooling globally and in the region. And of course, you know, UK ambitions uh, in scaling up innovation in sustainable cooling. I would now like to uh, turn it over to session one. I am your moderator, uh, Leila Kanji, and I am a climate finance investment lead and senior policy advisor uh, with the UK government, UK Bays. Uh, and I lead on energy storage and uh, sustainable cooling policy. Uh, so let me thank everyone for joining us today and especially the panelists as well uh, for, for sharing their time and their expertise. I would like to introduce uh, Loretta Foran, who is um, a senior operations officer at IFC, the International Finance Corporation. And uh, she has helped launch the IFC Tech Emerge program, which delivers a sustainable cooling innovation solutions amongst others. Uh, she holds an MBA from INSEAD, a micro, a micro master's of supply chain management from MIT and a bachelor of commerce from Queens University. We then have Jitin Galani, who is CEO of Promethean Power Systems, which is a pioneer in enabling access to sustainable cold chain and the world's most challenging solutions. He holds an MBA from Emory University and a BA in economics from the University of Michigan. Uh, he has over 15 years of experience leading companies in businesses ranging in size from one to 30 million. And then finally, we have Sneha Sachar. She's an energy professional with over 20 years of experience covering built environment at the intersection of energy efficiency and climate change, as well as cooling. She's currently consultant to the Rocky Mountain Institute and has been an integral part of their cooling and knowledge products over the past three years, including the Global Cooling Prize. She's also a strategic advisor to the Alliance for the Energy Efficient Economy in India and has had significant policy focused um, cooling work there, including the development of the India Cooling Action Plan. If I can hand it over to the panelists and perhaps what I can suggest is if each one can go through how their work is relevant to this discussion, um, I will give it to Loretta first. Please, Loretta, thank you. Great, thanks Leila, and great to be joining you today. Uh, so I am with IFC's Disruptive Technologies and Funds team, and so our team works across the entrepreneurial ecosystem, and we invest in companies that are disrupting the conventional sectors with innovative business models and technologies across clean tech, ag tech, ed tech, health tech, et cetera. But for us, specifically in the cooling space, as you mentioned, we've been partnering with the UK government and have an active tech emerge sustainable cooling program that's currently operational in India, Mexico, Colombia, and Nigeria. And through this program, we look to identify energy efficient, cost effective, and climate smart cooling technologies, pilot them in local markets to get the business case and use case to show that they can have the, the climate impact and reduce costs that can be sustainable and scalable. So I look forward to sharing some examples with you later. Thanks. 
And Jitin, if I may pass it to you. Uh, yes, thanks, Leila. Um, I'm Jitin Galani, CEO of Promethean Power Systems. Um, at Promethean, uh, we're working to improve farmer livelihoods with sustainable and accessible cold chain solutions. Uh, Promethean designs and manufactures energy storage systems for distributed cold storage applications in the world's most challenging conditions. Uh, we've developed a thermal battery storage solution uh, that can be utilized in rural areas without uh, uh, consistent power. Uh, this has been uh, widely used in India for uh, preserving milk and produce uh, at the farm gate, uh, providing farmers access to markets and confidence to expand their farming activities uh, and enabling uh, food processors to uh, source produce from uh, remote villages that were not accessible and connected to the uh, organized food system uh, in a reliable manner. Uh, we're working with most of the large food and dairy companies in India and uh, developing new products and business models uh, to really enable more sustainable and accessible solutions uh, for farmers and food processors in India and across the world. Thank you very much, Jitin. And finally, Sneha. Hi, everyone. Uh, it is my pleasure to be a part of this discussion. Uh, as Leila mentioned, I'm associated with the two organizations, Rocky Mountain Institute in the USA um, and Alliance for an Energy Efficient Economy in India. And my work over the better half of last decade has focused predominantly on cooling. So speaking to Rocky Mountain Institute first, um, we've been working in the cooling space for around four years now, starting with the Global Cooling Prize that was launched in 2018 to find a radically innovative cooling solutions with five times lower climate impact than today's prevalent technology um, to counter the uh, uh, impacts, anticipated impacts of the exponential cooling growth that the world is facing today. Uh, RMI or Rocky Mountain Institute has also completed a primer on sustainable space cooling with the World Bank SMAP group. Um, and currently we are undertaking a sustainable urban cooling guide, uh, which is a cool coalition supported initiative. So while our uh, cooling prize worked work focused on breakthrough cooling technologies. Both the space cooling primer and the urban cooling guide reflect a broader whole system approach to addressing cooling through a combination of both pull, push and pull mechanisms. And then on the Alliance for an Energy Efficient Economy, uh, we've been working in India on cooling specific work for uh, perhaps oh, about six years now uh, with some very key um, policy pushes such as the India Cooling Action Plan, which was launched in 2018. And um, the Alliance is also now involved in the implementation of it. Um, again, a combination of uh, uh, push and pull mechanisms that are a part of the India Cooling Action Plan recommendations. And most recently, the ongoing initiative on developing a global methodology that uh, countries can use across the world for developing their own national cooling action plans. And this is under the Ages of Cool Coalition and in partnership with the United Nations Environment Program, UNSCAP, and many, many cool coalition members, um, some of whom are on the panel as well. So um, over to you, Leila, thank you. Thank you, Sneha, Loretta, Jitin. Uh, we have some great expertise on this panel today. Uh, so just a quick reminder, if you have any questions, please do send them through and uh, we'll see uh, which ones we can address in the time that we have. Uh, so I'm going to hand it over to Loretta um, and perhaps Loretta, if you can speak for about five minutes on uh, your perspective and your experience on specifically which innovative sustainable cooling technologies and approaches do you consider to have the strong potential for scale up in the Asia Pacific region to address climate change, resilience and access objectives? Grateful for your thoughts. Thank you, Loretta. Great, thanks. So as, as we've heard, there's an increasing demand for cooling in Asia Pacific, and we know cooling is essential for economic development, productivity, human health and food security. But if we continue business as usual, energy for cooling will triple by 2050. But the good news is that we've seen a lot of cooling innovations that can offer some of the most cost-effective ways to fight, to fight climate change. So the commercialization of new and more sustainable cooling solutions can help mitigate the climate impact. So as I mentioned, we've been working with the UK government on a tech-emerge sustainable cooling innovation program. 
And through this program, we have 20 sustainable cooling pilots underway across retail, pharma, agri, manufacturing, real estate, logistics, and cooling services to test and validate the technologies that can cut costs, energy use, and the climate impact of cooling. In Nigeria, we're piloting temperature control logistics solutions, including storage at the farm gate, at aggregation centers, and long and short haul transport. In India, we've piloted solutions with large e-commerce companies and kicked off a pilot in the hospitality sector. And so through this work, we've seen many great sustainable cooling solutions with applications across sectors that can have significant impact and potential to scale in Asia Pacific. I'll share some examples across three categories, producing the cold, moving the cold, and storing or managing the cold. So in terms of producing the cold, some of the examples of scalable solutions we've seen is, one is a company called Purex. It's a Danish company that produces a solar powered air conditioner that can reduce energy consumption of cooling by up to 85%. It's a modular multi-split cooling and air conditioner powered by solar thermal energy and uses natural refrigerants. The air conditioning conditioner can be used in retail, clinics, schools, offices, or in residential applications. It's currently sold in a few countries at 2.5 kilowatt and 10 kilowatt units. And under our Tech Emerge Sustainable Cooling Program, the Purex air conditioner will be piloted in the hospitality sector in India, working with a large hotel chain. And we also may pilot in another context as well. Another example of producing the cold is a company called New Leaf. It's an Indian company that developed Green Chill. It's a biomass based cooling solution. It can generate refrigeration of up to 20 uh, metric tons from farm waste without using the grid or diesel. The solution provides refrigeration for cooling of fruits, vegetables, flour, and milk at the village or farm level, which can enable farmers to store produce until market demand and prices increase allowing them to earn more in a sustainable and environmentally friendly manner. So under Tech Emerge, Green Chill was installed in a distribution center, one of India's largest online grocery retailers, Big Basket. The solution doesn't have a compressor, has no moving parts in the refrigeration cycle, and uses a refrigerant with global warming potential value of zero and is carbon neutral. Based on initial performance data under that project, we see a 92% reduction in the use of fossil fuel-based electricity and a reduction in monthly operating costs. So this type of solution can be very economical, essentially eliminating the need for electricity within certain volumes, but you need an abundant source of biomass. So it may be good scaling potential in the agri context. So those are two examples of renewable energy-based cooling solutions, Purex with solar powered air conditioner and new lease biomass solution, which can generate cold and are climate positive, uh, non-fossil fuel based, and solves for energy access issues, especially in rural areas where people aren't connected to the grid or have inconsistent or unreliable power supply. In terms of moving the cold, we see a number of solutions leveraging phase change materials, which can be ideal for thermal management solutions because they're capable of storing and releasing large amounts of energy. Heat or cold can be stored from one processor period in time and used later in a different location. Phase change materials can provide thermal or insulation and temperature controlled transport and can be a scalable way to reduce the operating costs of cold chain logistics. One example is a company called Tesla, which is an Indian company, which leverages phase change materials to store thermal energy and slowly release it over time, enabling accurate temperature control during transportation of perishable goods. In our tech emerge program in Nigeria, Tesla will work with transport providers to pilot long haul cooling solutions. They'll outfit existing trucks with their cooling system to maintain consistent temperature and significantly bring down logistics costs, as well as carbon emissions captured compared, sorry, compared to traditional refrigeration solutions. Another example is Plus, an Indian company, which also has phase change based plates for retrofitting into insulated trucks and compared to to traditional reefer trucks, that technology can offer up to 40% savings in operating costs by virtue of reducing the diesel consumption. In our Tech Emerge Latin America program, PLUS will be piloted in two cases in small refrigerated trucks for last mile delivery and for refrigeration in offices built with containers located in remote areas. Lastly, in terms of storing or preserving the cold, another use of phase change materials we see with high potential to scale is in fulfillment centers where some of the key issues with fulfillment centers is that they're large open spaces and often if 
products are requiring temperature controlled, they often will cool to the lowest denominator. And people are constantly entering and exiting the fulfillment center, which requires more energy and is a lot of uh, inefficiency and energy waste. And so in India, we work with Big Basket, which is an online grocery retailer, to pilot phase change material storing racks. This allowed them to compartmentalize the, the space and store things at different temperatures to better manage the cold. So rather than storing everything at the lowest temperature, you can store some things at five degrees, some at minus eight, some at minus, at minus 18, with the objective to better maintain temperature parameters and reduce electricity consumption. And early results from that modular cold rack uh, installation shows a 22% reduction in electricity use. Managing temperature across space is a common issue, and we're now talking with Shandell, which is an online grocery retailer in Bangladesh, and they experience the same challenges of cooling to the lowest common denominator, cold escaping as people enter and exit fulfillment centers, leading to a lot of waste. So we may work with them to introduce new compartmentalized phase change material cooling solutions as well. And lastly, there's a lot of, we see a lot of IoT solutions, which are AI enabled, which can be used to manage the cold in uh, commercial buildings, health in hospitals, shopping malls, hotels, et cetera. Anyway, those are just a few examples of the type of sustainable cooling solutions we're seeing under our program that have potential to scale and have significant impact, but I'll pause there, thanks. Many thanks, Loretta. Some fascinating things and solutions that you have highlighted, um, both globally and what could be scaled up in the region. Thank you very much for sharing that. If I can now hand it over to Jithin. Uh, similarly, uh, if you could speak to five minutes uh, regarding uh, your experience and specifically as an innovator, um, what role can sustainable cooling innovators and technologies play in supporting the COVID-19 recovery in the Asia Pacific region? Jitin, I'll hand it to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Leila. Um, today I can share how Promethean is helping to enable sustainable cold chain in emerging markets uh, with a variety of products and business models uh, tailored to different contexts. Uh, a major obstacle in setting up a proper cold chain uh, is a lack of reliable grid electricity uh, to run refrigeration in remote villages. And in such conditions, typically a diesel generator would be required uh, for backup. Uh, unfortunately, this is a typically too uh, cost prohibitive, uh, which limits the adoption of cold chain. Uh, and that's where Promethean's thermal battery solution with phase change materials uh, plays a cr critical role as a sustainable alternative, and really for providing new opportunities uh, for farmers that live in these remote villages. Uh, during the pandemic, uh, we've seen that our uh, remote refrigeration systems have consistently uh, performed and supported uh, farmers and food processors to uh, source, uh, transport, um, and distribute uh, food products uh, all across uh, India. Uh, more, till date, uh, we've reached almost 2,000 villages, um, more than 75,000 farmers access our systems on a daily basis, um, and we've launched um, a variety of new products and business models to really expand that scale, uh, and I can describe them just briefly. Um, essentially, you know, we're focused on preventing food loss from farm to fork. Um, extending reach to farmers and villages that are poorly connected to organized sector or organized markets uh, and increase farmer and food processor profitability. Um, so our thermal energy storage solution was designed to address this problem. Um, and basically what it does is able to store uh, energy whenever power is available, which is very useful in uh, areas with intermittent grid power, and then release that energy uh, efficiently uh, as and when is required uh, for on-demand cooling. Um, so this can be used for uh, basically milk chilling solutions, uh, cold storages, uh, and refrigerated transport. Uh, we're now working with uh, a variety of food companies, including dairy, um, uh, fruits and vegetables, retailers, uh, meat and fish companies, and we can see multiple uh, uses of our, our technology inside India and across uh, the world. Uh, but specifically during COVID-19, uh, what we've been able to do is really implement uh, rural refrigeration hubs in remote villages uh, where small scale farmers uh, typically do not have access to refrigeration and do not have access to the organized sector. Uh, so with a new product, a micro milk chiller and a new business model uh, where we provide our micro milk chillers as a service uh, to farmer groups, uh, we're able to bring uh, small scale farmers uh, into the organized sector uh, in a viable manner 
uh, due to low cost, um, accessible and affordable refrigeration systems uh, that the farmers do not have to pay to access um, and is available to them at their uh, basically doorstep. Uh, once farmers have access to this technology, uh, they have assurance uh, that their product will, will reach uh, market safely. Uh, and once that uh, opportunity is made available, uh, you can see a significant change uh, in their uh, intention uh, and in their opportunity to increase their farm productivity uh, and expand their farm size. Um, with uh, partners that are able to provide access to important inputs, uh, access to the market, um, and access to finance, uh, these types of hubs can be the future of um, rural refrigeration and rural opportunities for these farmers. Um, and we're seeing a, a good adoption today, and we can see many examples uh, with our technology and other sustainable cooling technologies uh, where farmers are more directly connected to the markets in a very efficient manner. Uh, all of this has been accelerated uh, due to COVID-19 um, and we're excited to be part of the opportunity um, and the sort of forward progress that we're seeing uh, in bringing sustainable cold chains uh, for the benefit of all stakeholders. And we believe that a variety of products and business models will be the, will be the way to enable this. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. Great to see, you know, the opportunity that COVID-19 has presented to scale up access to cooling. Uh, so very interesting to hear about this. And now if I can pass it to Sneha to discuss uh, her role and expertise um, as part of RMI and the Alliance for Energy Efficiency. Um, uh, so Sneha, if you could uh, just speak five minutes how can prize-based approaches and other pull mechanisms for sustainable cooling help scale up and replicate innovative technologies and business models in the Asia-Pacific region? And also, what tools would be required to implement these? Grateful for your thoughts. Thank you. Sure, thank you for that question, Leila. So, um, well-developed prize-based approaches can be really a powerful change model for catalyzing innovation and demonstrating what is really possible in a sector. For example, the recently concluded Global Cooling Prize identifies two winners, uh, both exceeding the prize's criteria of a cooling solution with five times lower climate impact than today's typical air conditioners. And both solutions provide a life cycle cost at half that of today's standard room air conditioners. So that's a pretty radical uh, uh, solution and we are excited about it. But while the price has effectively shown us what is technically possible today, uh, but for the innovative technologies identified through a price to scale, it really requires a supporting ecosystem from industry to investors, to policymakers, and even consumers in order to ensure that what the innovators can bring to the market will actually see demand. So that's where pull mechanisms are absolutely pivotal. And the necessary pull mechanisms start with awareness and bold policies going hand in hand. Uh, second would be stimulated demand from early movers. And last but not the least, financing and market solutions to help overcome the first cost barriers and scale adoption. I'll unpack these a little bit. So um, awareness and bold policies refers to essentially our test standards, our minimum energy performance standards, and well-aligned um, product labels and rating systems. So again, to use uh, the GCP example, the Global Cooling Prize example, uh, through this process, we learned that the standards that are used to assess efficiency uh, were developed in the global north and they do not work so well in the global south. Uh, we noticed that a third of the performance improvements of the winning units were not able to be captured under the um, ISO uh, SEER testing protocols, the standard testing protocols prevalent in India today. And these savings related uh, mostly to efficiency in dealing with latent loads or humidity. So thus testing standards really have to be aligned and updated as the technology evolves so that they can capture the real life savings through uh, the super efficient technologies. Uh, next is we really need to flip the relationship between minimum energy performance standards or MEPs as we call them for short and the performance ladders. Today we build performance ladders from the floor of the MEPs 
Um, but our performance ladders should really have their top rung aligned with the best available technology and should ultimately lift uh, overall MEPS, providing safeguards for consumers and better information to inform their purchase decisions. And the role of governments in enabling this is key through bold policies. To highlight with an example, um, India's best in class air conditioner, that is a five star rated uh, AC, has an ICR of uh, 5.7. The winning solution in the global cooling prize are at an equivalent ICR of over 10. But if we used today's performance rating systems, the efficiency level of a technology that uses four times less electricity is going to sit in the same performance bucket as that of a unit that uses roughly two times less electricity. So from a consumer's, from a buyer's perspective, one option is not more attractive than the other. So why pay more for that? So it is really critical that our energy efficiency performance rating systems catch up with technology and anchor to the best available technology and consequently pull up the efficiency floor across the board. And in parallel, the product labels have to clearly inform the consumer about the differences in the products, the corresponding benefits, and ideally also the life cycle costs, which are actually a huge benefit. Uh, the next one I want to talk about is stimulating demand from early movers. And this is key. Um, and, and by stimulating demand from early movers, for instance, I mean such as through uh, government leading by example, government buyers and demand aggregation programs. Uh, adoption by public sector can really help advance consumer confidence in the new technology. Demand aggregation um, can be a very effective way to drive down the acquisition cost. And these strategies really go a long way in helping build assurance of market demand. And last but not the least, financing and innovative business models are a very important pull mechanism that help facilitate wide adoption. So first cost bias is prevalent in most markets today with the result that consumers, particularly the price sensitive segment, default to lower acquisition cost, even though this generally means being locked into higher lifetime operational costs. Case in point is that the two winning technologies in the prize cost while they cost two times the cost of a baseline unit today, but they operate at less than half the life cycle cost of the baseline unit. And the simple payback is around three, three and a half years. Um, so the focus really needs to shift to life cycle, life cycle cost. And while we've talked about an awareness drive to sensitize the consumers through appropriate messaging and perhaps even product labels, um, in parallel, we need enabling mechanisms that will help bridge the higher acquisition cost of efficient technologies. This will be key in driving adoption. And these can include traditional means such as financial incentives uh, or market models such as pay as you save programs and the emerging cooling as a service uh, model. I, Jitin also mentioned that uh, during his uh, talk. International development institutions can play a very significant role here by enabling programs financing solutions that can allow consumers to overcome the acquisition, higher acquisition cost of efficient technologies and uh, benefit from the dramatically lower life cycle costs. So pull mechanisms, you know, while prize approaches are great to, to give us a, um, a push and, and show us what is achievable, we definitely need robust pull mechanisms. Back to you, Leila. That's great. Thank you very much, Sneha. And realizing we're two minutes to time, uh, just very quickly, we do have a polling question we would like to ask the audience, which uh, we will put up right now. The question being, what type of support is most needed in your country for financing low carbon cooling? Uh, please uh, select your option, fiscal measures, taxes, grants and subsidies, research development demonstration, training and information, standards codes and labeling or government direct investment. Uh, thank you for that. Um, if I may... Uh, I, I think what I will do, apologies, uh, I know we do have some questions in the chat, um, but if I may just wrap up with some summary comments um, and just say, you know, phase change materials, uh, providing cooling as a service, whether it be through uh, this uh, micro milk chiller innovation, um, passive cooling technologies I know was not discussed and I know there's been some interest around that as well but also uh, the financing mechanisms, those pool mechanisms, all very critical for scaling up 
cooling globally, but also specifically in the Asia Pacific region. And so just, uh, just, you know, thanking you for sharing your time and expertise here. You know, these are very important discussions that we will have further evidence as we continue with scaling up these solutions and driving that ambition and innovation and uh, research development demonstration. Uh, I will now hand it over to Clotilda Rossi Disquio uh, to uh, take over for session number two. Uh, Clotilda, over to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leila. Thank you to all panelists for the very interesting insights that were shared and the discussion that we will try to continue here, where we will refocus on innovative approaches to market building and uh, business models. So please, um, yeah, very briefly about myself. I'm Senior Specialist for Energy Efficiency as well as Cooling at sc for all and I've been working in the energy sector as member of McKinsey German office at Truboden, which is a Mitsubishi heavy industry group company and at SIPA Center on Energy Policy at Columbia University. I would like now to introduce the panelists that will be joining me today uh, for the second session discussion. So which are Daniela Schmidt from the ADB, uh, Dr. Boshen and uh, uh, Mr. S. P. Gernay, thank you very much for joining me. Um, so Daniela Schmidt worked with different organizations in emerging markets on a variety of programmatic energy infrastructure solutions. These organizations include the Chatham House, Santec, Scatic Solar, Grameen Shakti, the International Renewable Energy Agency, and now currently the Asian Development Bank. Thank you, Daniela. And uh, to Dr. Bo Shen, um, very briefly, he's a research scientist at the International Energy Analysis Department of the Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, which is a US, uh, a U.S. Department of Energy National Lab managed by the University of California, Berkeley. Dr. Shen has over 25 years of experience in energy research. He worked as an international consultant for the World Bank and the Asia Development Bank in a number of their technical assistance projects. Thank you, Dr. Shen. And um, Mr. S. P. Garnaik, who's um, the executive director and business unit head at the ESL. He leads many flagship programs, including business development at large scale implementation of energy efficiency projects through innovative financing mechanism. At present, he's handling 11 major national and international programs amounting to annual turnover of $250 million and working on to develop for new programs leading to investment opportunity of at least $500 million in the next two years. Thank you very much for joining me, joining us today in this panel. So um, first I would like to ask you uh, very briefly, just a one minute reply, if you could share with us how your work contributes to the deployment of sustainable cooling projects. Daniela, can I start with you? Yes, uh, certainly. Hello, everyone, and also welcome to ASEF 2021. So at ADB, we support governments and also the private sector to accelerate access to clean and efficient energy solutions. So, and of course, I mean, access to uh, electricity, clean energy and energy efficiency are important pillars for us to achieve sustainable cooling for all. So first of all, uh, in order to have access to cooling, we need to have access to reliable electricity. Second, in order to have access to sustainable cooling, we also need to think about clean energy. Uh, we already heard uh, panelists in the previous sessions uh, mentioning that uh, cooling, in particular space cooling, by means of air conditioning, can consume a lot of electricity. So we need to supply it with clean energy solutions in order also to curb carbon emissions. And third, uh, very closely related, because uh, cooling, in particular space cooling, can consume a lot of electricity, we need to think about energy efficiency. So, and my professional passion is to work across all these three pillars. So I'm currently working with governments and also power utilities uh, to uh, provide clean energy solutions in particular to rural communities, which of course can then also be linked to provide uh, cold storage solutions. 
And I'm working on new approaches uh, to scale efficient cooling and to make efficient cooling affordable and accessible for households in particular. So I hand back to you, Claudia. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniela. Um, can I ask um, Bo to go next? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity in participating in this uh, session. Um, I, I'm a policy scientist at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab, lab located in Berkeley, California. Uh, basically, my organization is one of the U.S. government uh, national lab uh, focusing on assessing policy and technology solution to decarbonizing current energy system. Uh, including the cooling system uh, through energy efficiency and uh, renewable energy. Um, and the, for, uh, for the last two years, uh, have been, I have been leading an uh, Asian Development Bank uh, technical assistance project in deploying uh, climate-friendly uh, cooling solutions through market and the financing uh, innovation. So basically, uh, when you need uh, to scale up the cooling solutions, uh, you, we have to look at you know, a different uh, opportunity presented in a different sector in the city. So this could uh, really scale up a lot of opportunity, bundle those opportunity together. So this is uh, what we have been focused on, uh, city scale kind of applications. Uh, thank you, back to you. Thank you very much, Bo. And can I ask please SP also to share his very first views, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much and a pleasure to be here. Uh, uh, I represent Energy Efficiency Service Limited. It is an entity under Ministry of Power, Government of India. And ever since its inception in 2009, uh, large scale energy efficiency projects have been implemented in various uh, sectors of our Indian economy. And what we could see that uh, uh, roughly 45, over 45 billion units of uh, electricity has been saved by our interventions. And that has gone into super efficient appliance deployment in the sectors like domestic, agriculture, municipalities, and so on and so forth. We have also ventured into the clean energy area. And uh, as far as cooling is concerned, uh, um, we see that this country is projected to see the world's largest, fastest growing uh, cooling demand in the next five years. And we could see, uh, you know, the Indian Cooling Action Plan where ESL also participated and supported very actively uh, to align with the Indian policy. Uh, we see that, uh, you know, there is a need to bring down the cost of the entire uh, plans. I mean, particularly when we talk about the unitary air conditioners and making them affordable to the common consumers. Uh, this is going to be a great challenge and ESL after its successful programs in the domestic efficient lighting program with the bulk procurement and the demand aggregation approach where we could see that a substantial cost reduction and uh, we tried to adopt the similar model to, to the air conditioner market also in that process and it is good to see that we got a lot of supports. Uh, uh, directly indirectly from multinational agencies, including ADB World Bank. Uh, the United Nations Environment Program, USAID, and also we are active, uh, closely working with LVNL and also the Rocky Mountain Institutes. So apart from the air conditioner market, also we are trying to go into the other sectors of the cooling, like the chillers, uh, uh, then district cooling system, and the tri-generation system. So cooling is in our very big agenda, and because we see that is the future of the country as far as energy consumption, the CO2 emission reductions, as well as the peak demand reduction of the uh, you know, the, uh, the electricity utilities are concerned. Thank you. Thank you very much. Daniela, can I please ask you then to share any recent project and experience uh, of the ADB in sustainable cooling? It would be great to have an answer in a few minutes, as uh, so four or five minutes, so that we maybe be able to pick up some of the questions that are already in the Q&A box. Thank you. Yes, most certainly. So, of course, I mean, we have heard it already, right? There is no doubt that access to cooling is very important uh, for our health, for our well being, for quality of life, but also for our productivity. And I can well imagine that some of you are sitting right now in a well air conditioned room, uh, or many of us were actually living in countries with very hot temperatures. I mean, how wonderful it is that we can have access to air conditioners, to sleep well at night, to be productive the next day. 
Now, it has been project projected that uh, households in Asia will buy at least 680 million air conditioners in the next 10 years, and most of them will be first-time purchases. So, and of course, I mean, it's great, right? Uh, because that means more and more people do have access uh, to cooling. But here's the thing. I mean, it's also projected that seven out of 10 of these air conditioners could potentially be very inefficient. So households tend to buy air conditioners that on average consume 50% more electricity than the efficient models that are already available in the market. So why is that? Because that's what households can afford. That's what most households can afford. Many households cannot even think of buying efficient air conditioners because they cost twice as much. So even if we explain, yes, uh, you can save over the lifetime of the product, what really matters for many households is what they can afford today. So now, uh, of course, as you can imagine, that could start to become a problem, not only for the households, because it does represent a burden on their budget if they have to pay substantially more in electricity, uh, but for all of us, right? We have to ask, where is this electricity coming from? Uh, how expensive will be that electricity? Can we supply that electricity with clean energy? What will it mean in terms of building additional infrastructure to transmit and distribute that power? And here we also have to keep in mind that uh, this is a capacity that will only be used for short periods during peak hours. So it could be very expensive to build, operate, maintain, and distribute uh, that infrastructure just for inefficient cooling. So for example, we did some calculations in Thailand. And here, if households continue to buy rather inefficient air conditioners, that could mean that in 10 years from now, Thailand would need 6% more electricity just for inefficient cooling of residential buildings. So now this power would come from natural uh, gas, for example, that means also potentially 6% more in carbon emissions. So completely opposite direction we want to go to. So here, of course, um, we started to think, or we have to think about an approach, a solution, how can we make cooling, efficient cooling, accessible and affordable for households? How we can we help households to overcome that barrier of upfront cost? And in the last year, we started to work with a power utility uh, in Asia to look for a potential solution, for a potential approach. And uh, so we started looking initially at different uh, energy efficiency programs that are already existing around the world, but all of them have a bit uh, certain limitations. What we then did was looking at telecom companies. Now you probably ask yourself, why telecom companies? But think about it, telecom companies are very successful in selling smartphones to millions of customers. So they have a very successful business model. Affordability doesn't seem to be such a major issue in that case anymore. So how do they make these high-tech products available? First of all, it's data, it's digital platform, and it's really attractive payment plans. So we started to think, okay, could we do the same? Could a power utility do the same, but for efficient air conditioners? So similar to telecom companies, power utilities already supply electricity to thousands, millions of households. They, ha they have a really well-established uh, and unique relationship uh, with households or other customers to provide potentially efficient cooling solutions. Now, power utilities also have a huge amount of data, historic data points, like for example, monthly electricity consumption. Um, electricity bill payment, geographic location. So an utility can use these data points to profile customers and to offer them the best possible product. And they can use that data also as a proxy to deter determine, for example, creditworthiness. And that leads me to the next point. So could a power utility, for example, also offer an on bill payment plan where the household could get a credit to cover the higher upfront cost for efficient air conditioners and then pay it over time. And at the same time, could the power utility create a digital platform 
to connect customers with different ecosystem partners and also to lower cost. So we started to explore that idea further and uh, we collected a lot of data. We also did surveys among 4,000 households and developed a solution. And our solution is a digital service for households to purchase the efficient air conditioner at the price of an inefficient one. So now let me quickly walk you through uh, the experience, the customer experience. So the customer would access the digital platform through a website or an application. The customer tells the platform exactly what they are looking for. So which kind of, for which kind of room, for example, they would like to purchase the air conditioner. How big is the room? How many people are usually occupying the room when the air conditioner would be used? And for how many hours does the customer plan to use the air conditioner? The platform will then use that information to recommend certain options that exactly match the customer needs. So the customer will choose that option and the information will then be directly transmitted to the manufacturer. So the utility does not have to store any products. And then the manufacturer will basically ship the product to the installer. The installer will deliver and install the product at the customer's place. Now, why are the digital platform the customer will also get a credit from the bank to cover the higher upfront cost uh, for the efficient air conditioning. And then the customer will be able to use the electricity savings it will have from buying the efficient air conditioners compared to an inefficient one and repay the credit over time. And it works. So for households, it's really feasible to purchase an efficient air conditioner at the price of an inefficient one or to use the savings and even less the savings to repay back the credit. Now, for... Um, sorry. Okay. Now, for utilities, what does that mean? For utilities, the model is also financially viable and financially sustainable. And that's very important to provide a scalable solution. So the utility we calculated can actually make a profit with a new business opportunity of selling efficient air conditioners via a digital platform. The utility, of course, can save electricity, which means it can save costs and additional infrastructure. The utility can also substantially contribute to carbon emission reduction. So overall, everybody benefits. Everybody can save money, can save costs, can save carbon emissions. So we believe that this could be a very attractive approach. And I invite you when you think that, or when you would like to explore that with your country, with your power utility, or perhaps in partnership with your power utilities, please reach out to us and we will be happy to look into how we can support you to explore that opportunity further with you. Thank you. Back to you, Peter. Thank you very much, Daniela, for sharing with us this experience and this very interesting approach on how to push uh, efficient cooling technologies. Um, I would like to ask now um, Bo, and I would like to pick some of the questions that have been asked actually uh, while I'm asking you. So there were some questions related to the step necessary to uh, shift to zero carbon or low carbon economies. So I would like to ask you, what role can sustainable cooling play when considering decarbonizing strategies? Okay, thank you. Um... Yeah, when considering decarbonization strategy um, that aim at addressing climate change challenge, uh, sustainable cooling can play a significant role uh, in many ways. Uh, first, um, I believe sustainable cooling will address uh, the climate impact 
uh, of the restaurants, uh, HFC-based restaurants. Uh, that has a global warming potential of thousand times of carbon dioxide and their emission are increasing uh, 10 to 15% per year. A study has shown that uh, facing down HFC alone can uh, cumulatively avoid uh, the equivalent of more than 100 uh, gigaton of CO2 emission by May century and avoid a global uh, temperature increase of 0.5 C degree at the end of this century. Uh, second, as cooling consume, consumes enormous amount of electricity currently supplied by fossil fuels, uh, sustainable cooling help improve uh, cooling efficiency. Uh, and the operation of refrigeration and air conditioning is pro pro uh, projected to be one of the top drivers of global electric electricity demand, demand increase over the next few decades. Uh, air conditioner uh, and electric fans uh, used for cooling consume a lot of, uh, uh, a huge amount of uh, fossil fuel powered electricity that account for nearly 20% of the electricity used in buildings. Uh, CO2 emission uh, caused by uh, cooling energy consumption have contribute nearly 10% of global CO2 emissions. So uh, improvement in cooling energy efficiency will create a big energy and cost savings and bring significant climate benefit, potentially avoid more than uh, 100, another 100 gigatons of CO2 equivalent by 2050. And third, uh, cooling is a critical uh, to power system flexibility, uh, as mentioned, uh, uh, pointed out by uh, uh, previous uh, speakers. Um, and uh, that is essential for increased integration of renewable um, so the power system need to be uh, to balance the supply and demand in the power grid in real time, which can be achieved either by centralized power plant or by consumers being able to change their uh, consumptions. Customer load response, uh, load response is becoming a new strategy uh, that can enhance the flexibility of the power system. Um, a highly flexible power system is essential to integrate variable renewable energy. Uh, so refrigeration and air conditioning uh, load uh, are very suitable uh, to provide this kind of a uh, demand response. Uh, in addition to uh, improving uh, power system flexibility, uh, cooling can also help enhance uh, power system reliability. Uh, cooling energy use is often at the highest uh, during peak consumption period. So simultaneous operation of large number of cooling equipment will, uh, will increase the system peak, de uh, peak demand, seri seriously affecting the power grid reliability, especially under extreme temperature or you know, congested power system. So effective, uh, effectively managing demand peak can have a great impact on controlling customer energy costs while helping maintain uh, power system reliability. Uh, in addition to the above, uh, the role played by the system of cooling, there are also other opportunity. Um, and for example, efficiency and the climate benefit can be captured through use of waste heat and the application of combined cooling, heating, and power. And the cooling operation efficiency can be optimized through digitization and smart control. Uh, cooling energy use can be uh, reduced uh, cool, uh, through a cool roofs, uh, passive, bu uh, passive building designs, and uh, urban planning that reduce the heat island effect. And uh, as mentioned by others, the thermal energy storage can be adopted to not only create a cost saving, but also support power system flexibility. And coordinate or coordinated use of a renewable, for example, like a PV and a solar thermal in the cooling sector can help reduce the sector's carbon footprint. Uh, promoting sharing economy uh, to share underutilized the refrigeration cooling resource um, can help achieve greater res uh, resource efficiency. Uh, 
and effective program recycling, uh, replace, uh, repla uh, recycling, replace the cooling equipment will help uh, minimize their environmental and the climate impact. And finally, as the impact of climate change intensify, the sustainable cooling, uh, sustainable and affordable cooling uh, uh, for all uh, not only mitigate cooling induced uh, greenhouse gas emissions, but also provide an important solution to climate change adaptation. Uh, so thank you very much, back to you. Thank you very much, Bo. Thank you for sharing your insights uh, on this uh, such important topic and how cooling has an impact on our climate too and how it needs to be accounted for when thinking of decarbonization. Um, SP, can I ask you um, if you could share uh, with us your insights and experience on successful implementation of sustainable cooling projects? Uh, thank you again. And uh, yeah, as I said earlier that this air conditioning market in India is rapidly growing and what we could see, uh, the penetration of this particular appliance is very low right now. It's uh, roughly 10%, that's the ownership. And, but we see about eight to nine million uh, you know, a number of uh, uh, new air conditioners are going into the market and being sold in the market every year. So uh, with a growth rate of about 12%, 13% per year, so this is going to actually dominate uh, in the Indian side. Uh, with the success of our lighting program, ESL conceptualized this uh, AC program in, in the year 2017, and the business and operational models are almost similar to the success, uh, I mean, that uh, lighting program. It's like uh, the demand aggregation, the bulk procurement, reducing the price by roughly 15 to 20%, and uh, taking as a model, which is pay as you save, that means no upfront cost to the consumers, and the consumer can pay back to us from the monetized energy saving. So in the first procurement phase, 100,000 ACs using conventional refrigerants uh, that were uh, purchased or procured. And in that time, uh, we targeted uh, the uh, IESER, that is energy efficiency ratio of 5.2, and uh, that was 15% uh, more energy efficient than the latest uh, five-star labeled product at that point of time, and 35% uh, from the average uh, three-star product. So we targeted about 85 million uh, USD uh, investment, and. Uh, and the repayment mechanism, as I said, was the PP as you save model. But precisely it went into the institutional consumers, the primarily the government buildings, and where we replaced uh, the inefficient air conditioners with this efficient air conditioner in more than 10,000 number of buildings across the country. Uh, but uh, we could not touch that, uh, you know, uh, the 10, 000, uh, 100,000 numbers, only 30,000 ACs could be, 30 to 30, I think 35,000 ACs could be deployed. But we revisited this earlier AC program through these consultative engagements. We discussed with public utilities, manufacturers, the laboratories, the supply chain, how to deploy it in a programmatic manner. Uh, if you see now the Indian average, uh, you know, the ER value, the energy efficiency ratio value in Indian uh, uh, market is about 3.2 and the five star is about 4.5. So we tried to do a pilot project with a super efficient air conditioner and we targeted a year value of 4.5 and intends to do uh, a, a leaf, uh, you know, leapfrog in the current energy efficiency levels. Uh, we also promote uh, promote it, uh, the use of the low global warming potential refrigerants as in this is in our Indian cooling action plan. So broadly, this high efficient AC with low GW refrigerant was the key ingredient the price reduction through the bulk procurement and the, with, the, with the economy of scale and addressing the issue of buyback of the old AC also. That also we tried so that that can also add to a, uh, you know, reduce the upfront cost to the consumers because we take away the old ACs and dispose it of an, in an environmental friendly manner. As far as deployment mechanism are concerned, we went through a public procurement process. Being a government institution, we cannot just uh, you know promote any single brand or single technology. So after setting the technical specifications and other terms and condition of the procurement, a competitive and international competitive bidding was done uh, by ESL during March to May 2019. Out of the qualified bidders, Bultas, that is one of a leading uh, you know uh, manufacturers of the market uh, uh, leader uh, of India, that they were selected. We did some partnerships, particularly with the multilateral agencies to get some technical assistance support, the knowledge base and all. 
So this ESL is implementing a global environment facility program right now, where ADB is also a you know partner to us, and we have established an energy efficiency revolving fund with a Jeff grant of about 13 million US dollar. And out of that, we have earmarked 5 million US dollar that is to be utilized for this air conditioning program. In fact, this particular thing, this, uh, you know, this revolving fund, that is actually aim is to reduce the overall cost of the product and give a market push. Uh, out of this 50,000 uh, procurements, what we have done, we have so far deployed around 10,000 numbers, but it was severely hit by two consecutive seasons uh, by this pandemic, so we lost that season. But hope so in the near future, in the near near uh, uh, you know a few months, it would again pick up and we could achieve that. We are doing also with the utilities. ESL has partnered with many electrical utilities, the distribution companies, to deploy this product at consumer end as a part of their DSM regular demand side management regulations. It's a mandate for them. So we are now working in three provinces in India and aim to deploy around 20,000 ACs in this region. And in that process, we have also partnered with uh, one of the uh, you know, supporting agency called P4G Partnership for Growth uh, in, this, in this initiative. Uh, to make the things more simple, we have also created a e-platform that is eslmart.in, where consumer can purchase this product online. This will not be available in the retail store, this product. And the, the procedure of participation and every scheme are mentioned in the ESL Mart.in and every, anyone one can go and see that there the consumer can give their option, make the payments, put the grievances, everything is can be available. I mean, it's a platform which is running. We have also engaged the demand aggregators and channel partners with us. And uh, we have uh, now more than 70 channel partners and the demand aggregators who are actually going to the B2B consumers or the bulk consumers and getting those, uh, you know, orders or you can say convince to them and, uh, you know, con you know, you know, uh, you know, telling them to participate in this program. Uh, to, we are also giving package solution to the industries and corporates. ESL has also, you know, integrated this program into other programs like LED lights, energy efficient ceiling fans, and giving this as a package solution to the large corporate and industries. 10,400 buildings, 800 railway stations, 64 airports. This has been covered under this particular program. The last but not the least, the most important thing for this kind of program is how you can create a market outreach or the awareness. So media awareness, awareness through media and market outreach has played a key role. And we have prepared detailed media outreach plan, which involves outreach activities like kiosks, banners, outdoor banners, paper advertisements, and digital marketing, and so on and so forth. And we, we thank to the international agencies who have supported us in, in this initiative, but the work is who have just started, it is halfway done, and we look forward to a greater penetration or greater success of this program going forward. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for sharing your broad experience, your ambitious plan for, for the upcoming period, and, uh, and really the um, experience in India is very, very valuable. So um, I would like now to uh, get back to Daniela as there are a few questions related to the, the slides that she shared and, and the system. So one is a very brief questions that is asking whether um, this digital platform um, that allows to select air conditioner also account for building insulation and um, a more, you know, um, questions related to how can we actually try to change attitudes in people um, along with energy savings so to make sure that there is not an overly um, energy consumption comes also from uh, this changed attitude. So I know this is a very long question, so I would really like you to ask to answer only in one or two minutes. Thank you. Sure. Thank you for asking this question. So number one, uh, I mean, yes, this digital platform was initially focused on air conditioner, but the beauty about digital platforms is that it's very well open to easily or fairly easily uh, build in uh, new products, build in uh, new suppliers, new manufacturers, uh, new customers, um, so it can be expanded. And I agree that as another important uh, step is actually to look at the building envelope uh, 
and to look into uh, whether we can support uh, uh, building insulation also through that uh, particular model. Um, then in terms of, I think other panelists had also already alluded to that, uh, definitely there needs to be a stronger effort in raising uh, more awareness, uh, how much electricity actually air conditioners are consuming. Um, in the meantime, I also hope like uh, what we are trying to really achieve with this digital platform and also other colleagues on the panel is really to drive consumers uh, to uh, adopt the most efficient uh, solutions and products that are already available. And uh, so that is an important part behind uh, that uh, business model. Uh, we, um, we evaluated and we assessed and we now look forward also to implement is really um, to, to make it attractive for consumers. So for example, uh, okay, yes, even if you're gonna have four air conditioners in your house, that's aimed for that they are the most efficient air conditioners you can have because this already can contribute quite substantially to electricity savings. Um, otherwise, I don't think we can deny anybody to access any cooling products, but it's really to find mechanisms um, either through that business model or other business models or in combination with incentives and uh, subsidy programs to really bring consumers to adopt the most efficient technology like we would do with smartphones, right? So, yeah. Back Thank you me. very much. Thank you. Thank you very much for your insights and for a reply to these questions. I'm afraid we are a little bit running out of time here. So I would really like to thank the panelists uh, for the very interesting insights and conversation that we had. I would like, um, if possible, that to share also the um, reply, the answers to the polling questions that we have asked before. And it was basically what is mostly needed in your country for financing low carbon cooling. And I found it particularly interesting and uh, really, uh, again, a measure of the complexity of the topics, how almost all the, the possible answers are very close. So that the slight winner is training and information followed by research, development and demonstration. But actually, so that the lowest, uh, which is standards, codes and labeling is very close. It's just a few percentage points lower. So it's really a complex topic that needs really a number of measures and um, systems to be put in place in order to be to be addressed and to be um, supported. So I would like now to ask my colleague Alvin, Alvin Jose, uh, to give uh, the uh, closing remarks uh, of the session. So uh, Alvin Jose is a principal energy specialist with Sustainable Energy for All. Alvin has almost 14 years of experience in the international energy and environmental sector, specifically on low carbon energy technologies, energy efficiency, and multilateral environment agreements. He has previously worked with the uh, UNEP, UNDP, Terry, and the, the Bureau of Energy Efficiency at the Go Government of India. Thank you, Alvin. Thank you very much, Clotilde. Thanks for that introduction. Uh, good morning to everyone participating in this workshop from Vienna. Uh, this was a very uh, interesting uh, set of discussions. And what I could really get is that uh, the, the, from the big picture, it is uh, clear that uh, cooling is not a luxury anymore, especially uh, when we are looking at almost 3 billion people that face some sort of uh, risks due to lack of cooling access for their development needs. And sustainable cooling is also central to meeting the SDG 7 goals and SDG 13 goals uh, for the climate action. Uh, as we heard from LBNL, that how uh, as sustainable cooling is integral to global decarbonization efforts, and also it provides opportunities for integrating uh, variable renewable energy and power system flexibility. So certainly there's a lot of wins uh, as, long, as, as far as sustainable cooling uh, is concerned. Uh, but of course, uh, if you have to mainstream this, this it is important to have a systems approach uh, in all the three main pillars that we are looking at, which is uh, thermal comfort, health, and food and agric agriculture sector. We saw uh, how the role of uh, development finance institutes is is important for this uh, to to promote innovative solutions. Uh, uh, we saw IFC's tech emerge 
uh, program that they are piloting uh, several type of technologies. We saw the private sector entrepreneurship efforts uh, from Promethean uh, power systems it, uh, and how they're helping small scale farmers to improve their uh, livelihoods and also be resilient in this ongoing pandemic. Uh, we saw, of course, the uh, also how Rocky Mountain Institute's thought leadership about how the ecosystems are to be developed to promote innovative solutions and stimulate demand for early movers. Uh, then we saw some, the, the most important aspect is making to, uh, to make uh, energy efficiency affordable uh, for end users because a lot of these uh, countries have households that cannot afford them and it is important to have such models. We saw the innovative models used by EESL uh, through their bulk procurement and demand aggregation program and they're trying to now use this in cooling appliances. We saw ADB's innovative pilot project on digital platform and combining credit access uh, for households to uh, actually own uh, energy efficient appliance at the same price of uh, inefficient appliance, which I feel is very, very important in terms of moving consumer choices. Uh, lastly, I would like to say that this, is year, this year is a very important year. Uh, we have the COP26 uh, coming up under the presidency of the UK. We have the UN's high level dialogue on energy and we need to, uh, as a global community for on, on sustainable cooling community at, at least, needs to come together and so promote and coalesce uh, for sustainable cooling. Uh, I would like to thank all the speakers uh, once again for their sharing their experience. And I look forward to these innovative solutions uh, presented uh, being scaled. Uh, we hope that this deep dive workshop has provided you good insights on opportunities for innovative solutions for mainstreaming uh, sustainable cooling in Asia Pacific region. Uh, thank you for your active participation and stay safe.